Coming up next on Arizona Horizon, what effect does the new minimum wage have on the state budget? And we'll look at the governor's plan to help state universities see up to a $1 billion windfall. Those stories next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Arizona PBS, members of your PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simon. Senator Jeff Flake is trying to get more Border Patrol agents hired with the introduction of a bill that streamlines the hiring process. The Boots on the Border bill would make it easier for those with law enforcement and military experience to get hired with Customs and Border Protection by waiving the polygraph requirement. What we're saying is if they have had a clean record uh, with the law enforcement agency that they've been at and they've had un uninterrupted employment there that they s simply shouldn't have to redo or retake uh, the exam. This alone isn't going to do it. Uh, this is a part of it. Uh, but we really need to hire about 3,000 a year in order just to keep up with attrition. Uh, and right now we're, we're hiring fewer than 600 a year. So we have a long way to go. Senator John McCain is a co-sponsor of the bill. The state Supreme Court held hearings today on whether or not Proposition 206, which hiked the minimum wage, is constitutional. At today's hearing, the Arizona Chamber of Commerce and Industry, along with other business groups, argued that the proposition violated a state law requiring that a ballot measure must identify funding sources if that measure calls for more state spending. Attorneys for Prop 206 argued that the higher costs aren't mandated because they go to contractors. Prop 206 passed with support from 58 percent of voters. The measure increased the minimum wage to $10 an hour in January and will raise it to $12 an hour by 2020. Among the other concerns regarding the minimum wage is the claim by GOP leaders that the proposition will negatively impact the state budget. But a new study by the Grand Canyon Institute estimates that the wage hike will have a negligible fiscal impact on the budget. Here to talk about the study is Dave Wells, Grand Canyon Institute's research Director, good to see you again. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Uh, negligible impact on the state budget. Uh, the Chamber of Commerce says it's going to blow a giant hole in the state budget. What's, why, why are they, what's the disconnect here? Uh, depends on what do you think. If, if you had about $100, it's about 15 cents is what out of every $100 is what the, 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 the net cost of it is. I don't think that's a giant hole. I mean, we have an austerity budget, so these days you know, every little cent seems to count because we don't have money for anything. But, uh, but in the broader scheme of things, it's a pretty small amount. So basically you're talking about six to 14 uh, million a year? Is that, what, what are we talking about here in terms of? Uh, yeah, so, so the net cost, again, it all, there are variables that are, you know, depending on how things play out, but the, the actual cost of it, it'll, it'll be, is about um, 26 uh, million dollars is what they'll actually, you know, have uh, as a cost. And then there'll be uh, things that'll help uh, reduce that cost uh, based on uh, other impacts from the minimum wage. So six hundredths to 14 hundredths of the general fund, that's, that's what your study found. Uh, yeah, we found. I'm not sure I got your your. Well, your I, 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 I got it from your site there, so I'm, I'm yeah. assuming. I, but yeah. again, as, as the panel will show, for every hundred dollars, not a whole heck of a lot. Yeah, I was, saying, I was saying about 15 cents. It was 10 cents, but we slightly adjusted one of our cost estimates, so it's about 15 cents out of 100 dollars. That surprise you that, that amount there? That's no, not really, because it's, because you have to think that these are. Um, uh, the businesses that are impacted are essentially, I mean, they're paying low wage workers, they're getting paid, workers are going to get paid more, but that's not their only cost. So, uh, so effectively, um, the workers are getting a, a good size uh, pay increase, but it's only about half of that business's total costs. Uh, and so, uh, so even though the workers' costs might go up 20%, the businesses' costs are only going up 10 uh, and so, so it's a, it's not a, it's not a huge impact. And then these are not um, it's something that's uh, paid for 70 percent by the federal government, and they're only 30 percent from the state. So it's a, these things all make it smaller. This healthcare, uh, the healthcare contract with the providers, which was argued today at the Supreme Court, mm -hmm. uh, and again, uh, the Attorney General arguing against the idea that this was unconstitutional, saying these contracts uh, aren't, they're, they're not mandatory. But what your study is saying, as far as the cost to the state. For those workers, again, what are you seeing for the for the healthcare workers that provide services for the disabled, the elderly, et cetera? Yeah, right. Because right now they're getting paid 
maybe ten to eleven dollars an hour, and they're going to see their wages go up by somewhere around like a dollar fifty um, as a consequence initially of the minimum wage right. uh, next year, and uh, and that's going to have a uh, you know, a, a modest uh, impact on the budget. So when we, we uh, you know look at all together, it ends up being uh, and these are folks who are helping the disabled community and the elderly, so primarily uh, who we're who we're working with. And again, the net net effect on the budget uh, when you put them both together uh, next fiscal year is about twenty six and a half million dollars. As far as jobs lost uh, and what that cost could be to the general fund, what are you looking at? Well, we, we um, that's negligible because uh, of of the fact there's also another factor about it like my son has a minimum wage job and as soon as he gets money he spends it <laughs> really fast uh, and uh, the only money that doesn't get spent real fast is the money he gives me but uh, and the thing is that uh, lower wage workers tend to spend all their money and they tend to spend it locally uh, so that even though there's going to be a, we estimate about 13,000 jobs lost by 2020 as a result of it there's about 800,000 people who are going to get extra money as a consequence of it the typical worker will have about $1,400 more in income and when you put Put that all together, uh, you'll end up with about uh, at least, uh, and again, about a $2 million gain uh, for the general fund next year that'll eventually become about $4 million. And it could be a lot bigger than that. Uh, there's a, some, a couple economists from the Chicago Fed who think the effect could be about five times as big as that. But uh, we were trying to be a little bit conservative. Yeah, yeah, $2 million added. That's, that's interesting because that goes against, again, the conventional wisdom. Yeah, because you have multiple um, effects going on. But because uh, the main thing that what a minimum wage does is that you, we're paying for it basically, but it transfers income from higher income people down to lower income people. And uh, higher income people don't spend as much locally as low, low income people do. One other aspect, the last major point here regarding your study I found fascinating was because of this increase in wage, you might move some folks out of access, out of Medicaid. I mean, uh, and that makes a difference. Yeah, it's because uh, the and, and it, that one is really complicated in many ways, at least right now, and, and we'll see what it happens in a few years. But uh, but essentially, what's going to there are about thirty thousand people who are going to move categories or move out of Medicaid. Uh, you'll have about ten thousand parents who will go from a part that the federal government pays. Uh, uh, about two thirds to where they'll pay 90 percent, and you got about uh, 10,000 adults who move from out of Medicaid completely, and 10,000 kids will also move out of Medicaid. Uh, the kids will definitely move into kids care, so they'll still have health insurance, and uh, and right now the adults would move into exchanges, and uh, we'll see what happens with them. And, and as we saw, seven million dollars next year could be the number there, up to 17 million by 2020. Right. So, uh, so the 30,000 would that would be the impact by. Uh, 2020, and that would save the state about $17 million. Of course, that's a moving goalpost considering what's coming out of Washington regarding the Affordable Care Act and how much is replaced and how much is repealed and how much of that Medicaid money winds up back to Arizona. Right, but the state was, is still going to save something, but the question is what they'll actually save because um, right now what it sounds like the Republicans want to do uh, is they want to reduce the amount of federal money coming in, mm -hmm. uh, which means the state will have to you know, pay more, but the net effect of people moving out of Medicaid is still going to save the state uh, money. It's just hopefully that they'll be able to move into something else. Finally, the economic impact to schools, economic impact to nonprofits. How do you measure that kind of thing? And is that not a variable that needs to be understood? Well, it doesn't affect the general fund uh, and the, the effect on but, but economic act, but, but, but yeah, their yeah. activity would, you know, mm -hmm. ripple effect would wind up with the general fund in some way, shape, or form, would it not? Well, yeah, part of that $2 million are, is when people get uh, more income. And it's not going to, you know, burden school budgets too much. I mean, it's a pretty uh, modest figure. I mean, I'm on the Tempe Union High School District Budget Advisory Committee. I'm not sure if I got the figure right, but I think it's like $30,000 is what the cost is of compl compl complying with Prop 206. You know, and that's out of like a $75 million budget. So, so it's a, you know, they're pretty modest kind of things, and it's easy to be able to do that. And it's doing a good thing for these people because it's given them a higher amount of money to live off of. So when the Chamber of Commerce says it could blow a giant hole in the state budget, you disagree. Yeah, I'd say, you know, you know, there's a corporate tax cut that's $100 million that's coming in this year. That's more of a bigger giant hole than uh, this one is, Prop 206. Dave Wells, Grand Canyon Institute, thanks for joining us. We appreciate well, thank it. Thank you. Up next on Arizona Horizon, a closer look at a plan to open up $1 billion in bonding for Arizona's universities. We're in the middle of rather a drama. I've been thinking about the circumstances of the crime and the nature of love. It's romantic, is it? Isn't it? It seems to me as if the answer is right in front of me. I love you.
I'm a high-functioning sociopath. Gotta stay true. You are being irrational. My morals got me all my Need to go. Will you do a blood test? No. You wanna hit me now? I don't know what this is, but you got me good, just like you do. Do you think that makes me a wicked woman, sister? Will the prisoner rise? There is only one thing I would like. Pain. Sex. Heartbreak. Or love. You got me flagging. Oh, yummy. Papa? Is everything all right in there? Doug Ducey's proposed budget calls for the state's three universities to keep the sales tax revenue they generate to finance borrowing for research, development, and maintenance construction projects. Here to talk about the governor's idea and how it would affect state universities is Eileen Klein, president of the Arizona Board of Regents. Good to see you again. Thanks Great for joining us. Great to see you. Us. Thanks. Uh, give me a better definition of the governor's plan and your thoughts. About. Absolutely. Well, first, you can't not be thrilled. It's been a long haul for the universities over the past decade or so with all of the state budget cuts and so the entire university enterprise is delighted that Governor Ducey has put forward a proposal that would really allow us to reinvest and reinvigorate our capital infrastructure. So basically if is, is it a sales tax by the university or in a region is it one of these regional kind of things? Not at all. Work? It's quite simple. Our universities were one of six states where we're required to pay sales tax. So for the purchases we make or for taxes on construction or on utilities, for instance, we're required to remit sales taxes, the equivalent mm -hmm. of sales taxes for those. This proposal would allow us to instead keep those dollars and use them to do redevelopment of our own facilities plus invest in new research and educational facilities. Now are those dollars is capped I believe is it capped at like 37 38 yes, or something like that? Yes currently we we remit about 33 million dollars we're paying about 33 million dollars it would let us keep that those monies plus the growth that we get in the future. So with some matching dollars from our own budgets, we could generate about a billion dollars worth of support. Uh, that's a lot of support. <laughs> uh, R&D, construction projects, talk to us about what needs to get done and what you'd like to see get done. Well, we have, we have needs on both sides, both to refurbish facilities. Currently, we've got about $670 million of pent-up demand for refurbishment. These are things like roofs and HVAC systems and other safety elements. And so we want to take care of those. The state's not been able to keep up with its share of the formula for that. But importantly, it also lets us invest in new research and educational facilities. We have aggressive goals to grow research, and some people would say, well, who cares? Well, it matters a lot because it allows us to not just generate new knowledge, but also translate that knowledge into the economy, attract new, new research investment, from the federal government for sure, but also from the private sector. They want to be located near large research facilities, and this would give us the dollars so we can keep up with our capital construction. Is there a time frame regarding this bonding capability? It, it would be in perpetuity, really. It would allow us to keep these dollars. Rather than remitting to them to the state, rather than having them to grow other sources of state government, it would allow us to keep those dollars and invest them. Now, you know, municipalities aren't too crazy about <laughs> yes, this, because if you keep the dollars, that means what used to go to them is now being Stay, uh, stays at the universities. Is there a way to not hit the cities and towns and still keep this bonding authority possible? Right. Well, the truth is, it is a very, very small portion of their future collections, maybe one half of 1% of their monies, and sure, cities have had their challenges as well. But cities stand to really benefit from this, from our ability to educate more individuals for the workforce, by re rejuvenating city centers. The cities who've seen university facilities come into them certainly have been revitalized. And so we think the cities win from this proposal, 
and it's such a small amount of money that would be foregone revenue for them that we think it's a pretty small amount to quibble about. I know they're saying $7 million in lost revenue, and again, I think Tempe and Tucson have no problem with this, <laughs> but if you're talking about Peoria, you're talking about Yuma, uh, you're talking about Kingman, they might have some concerns. But again, is, this, is, there, is there some wiggle room here? Well, certainly, it's the legislature's prerogative to decide what to do with sales tax receipts, and ultimately, the legislature needs to decide that. It's not the city's money, it's the legislature's prerogative, and so we want to have that conversation because we think this is a really big play for Arizona. This billion dollars in capacity is going to allow us to continue to catapult our, our, our opportunities in higher education, which are so critical right now with two-thirds of all jobs requiring higher education. You mentioned earlier that uh, Arizona universities pay sales taxes, and that is somewhat unusual Correct. around that. What's that all about? How'd that Correct. happen? Correct. So, well, we're just one of six states that it happens to be how we do things. And so it's a chance to really have a tax reform at the same time that we allow dollars to be deployed for something our state critically needs, which is to invest in its universities. I know that some folks are saying that uh, they hear bonding authority, expanding bonding authority, they hear that, they say right. debt, they say right, more debt, right, they don't right. think we should have more debt, they think we have enough debt as it is. <laughs> Do they have a point? Well, they always we're keeping an eye on that. And the markets will really determine whether we're able to take on more debt. We have excellent bond ratings. All of these projects will still be reviewed by the legislature, and they'll be subject to public market scrutiny. So we feel very confident that we can afford this, and over time we'll just grow our capacity as the market allows. But the truth is we're in a growing state. We've got to take care of these needs for students and for our research growth opportunities, and so we are very excited. And we should mention that uh, the overall debt is receding in the past few years. Still, uh, payment on that debt is some $326 million. That's the eighth priciest segment of the budget. Well, as you point out, though, those prior programs are coming to an end. Mm -hmm. And really, it's been the state's investment in capital infrastructure in our universities that has catapulted us in our research rankings. The last time we had this type of investment, though, was 2003. So it's time for a new generation. Our buildings are, on average, 26 years old. And if we're going to get the top flight research teams, be able to, to participate in the largest research ventures and be competitive, we're going to need this state support. Governor also wants teaching academies as yes. well. Now, now is, is the teaching, is this part of the deal here? Or is this all one thing? <laughs> well, some of the dollars would be allowed to be expended for that purpose. And so we're delighted to partner with the governor and with our K-12 system and our community colleges to figure out new means to draw new individuals into teaching, to figure out ways to work with them to increase flexibility, remove some of the bureaucratic barriers to entering the teaching profession. But we think it's an opportunity to really reinvigorate our teaching programs. We've been renovating and innovating, but at the same time, it's important that we place a dedicated focus on this. We're going to have to grow the traditional pipeline, and of course, we see a real need to introduce more technology and more partnerships with higher education to get students connected to the core curriculum they need to be successful. So of, of the list of things that could be done, the teaching academy is pretty high up it's, there, isn't it? It is, and yeah. such, such a great need, so we're glad to be partnering on that. Again, one, one last concern uh, that I hear is that um, this kind of continues to open the door to playing favorites. <laughs> you know, the, the engagement districts, uh, all these kinds of things where the tax money goes back into the district or back into the area and doesn't go out further, and it's, it's seen as it's seen as an unlevel playing field. Do those folks have a point? Well, currently the state budget really is every year a, a reshuffling of priorities. And right now with the continued interest in growing jobs and really stimulating Arizona's economy, policymakers are searching for ways where they're not just expanding government, but they're finding ways to invest in things that are gonna bring true returns. So for instance, on our capital infrastructure proposal, every new square foot that we add in new building space returns 350 dollars to the state in real money from new business investment and research dollar investment. So we think that policymakers are smart to think about how to leverage very limited resources, and I think we're going to continue to see more of this type of thing. Are there accountability measures involved in all this, or is it the same as usual? Absolutely. No, we'll continue to be subject to legislative review, and certainly, you know, we are part of the, the state government in the sense that we are considered to be a vital part of the state's public education system. So we would expect that when the state's putting up its dollars that we're going to be providing full accountability. Is this, though, it sounds great, a billion dollars. This, <laughs> it lights sounds flash, like a lot, yeah. but in a 
growing state, I promise you, this is the beginning to, yes. get to where we need to well, be. Well, and I'm asking, is, is this enough to offset the cuts in recent years? I mean, the headlines are there. Steepest cuts from 2008 to 2015, 49th in states among university funding cuts per capita. And it doesn't sound like the current budget has a whole heck of a lot to restore some of those cuts. Right. Are, are, are we on, I mean, are we on the right track? Is the track still a little muddy? I mean, what, what's going on? Well, the state certainly is going to continue to you know, push forward, but we expect the revenue growth will be relatively slow. That's why we're happy about this innovative approach in the governor's budget. But importantly, he also dedicated $15 million for students and for supporting our Arizona resident students for higher education opportunities. So we have never once wanted to look back. We've been very, you know, we've been challenged certainly by the reduction in state support, but we want to make sure that going forward, we're really focused on getting money from the state in places where it can make the most difference. And right now, that is investing in our students, the individuals themselves, and in having the state help us with our facilities. Real quickly, response you've heard so far from lawmakers. Well, lawmakers have really begun to appreciate the connection between our public universities and economic growth in Arizona, which is a huge turning point. And so we're excited to work with them. What we've been hearing about is, you know, they want to talk more about this mechanism. Mm -hmm. But on the whole, they've been quite supportive of making sure that our universities are going to get more money because they realize they're worth the investment. It's good to see you here. Thanks Thank for joining so us. We much. appreciate it. Great to see you. And Friday on Arizona Horizon, it's the Journalists' Roundtable. We'll discuss the state Supreme Court hearing on a challenge to the new minimum wage hike and the Coyotes threaten to leave the Valley if they don't get a new arena. It's at 530 on the Journalists' Roundtable. That is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great evening. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Arizona PBS, members of your PBS station. Thank you. And thank you for tuning in to Arizona Horizon here on Arizona PBS. I'm Alice Ferris. You know, when you watch programs like Arizona Horizon, you know you're going to